The Centre Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics and Knightsbridge Overland. This month's Centre Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from downtown Washington, D.C. Visit cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles and be sure to follow them on Instagram so you can see what they're up to. Thanks, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, episode number 112. Thanks, Les, for introducing the podcast. This is the Center Steer Podcast. I'm your host, John Costage. Joining me over Zoom are Morgan and Dixon. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Pleased to be here from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And thanks for having me, as always. It is the July 2022 podcast. Harold is doing Harold things and hopefully will join us next month. Dixon, you are on the road with Placid Lassie, which is an aeroplane. Tell us about uh, where you are and a little bit about Placid Lassie. Well, I'm at Oshkosh, Wisconsin at the EAA Air Venture Air Show. This week, this little airport here is going to be the busiest airport in the world. (laughs) There's some 10,000 airplanes here, including Placid Lassie, which is a C-47 DC-3 that towed a glider on Norman for the D-Day landings at Normandy and then participated in a number of missions and operations across Europe in the Second World War and is now operated by the Tunison Foundation. A DC-3 makes series Land Rover owners look like amateurs. They're fascinating. <laughs> to start with, they use kiddie pools under the engines for the oil <laughs> leaks. And they the parts you need, wow, your garage All you have to do is show pictures of a DC-3 hanger and your wife will never bother you again about all your parts stash. (laughs) Is uh, Placid Lassie flying in the air show? Yes, there are actually going to be 11 DC-3 C-47s here this week. Do you know how many are left? There are a couple hundred flying. They, they, there's about 18,000 made. Many were, were trashed after the war. There were thousands of them flying. The, the question is, is that you can have airworthy aircraft that are sitting in museums or sitting at a, in a hangar here or there, but how many are actually flying on an annual basis is probably, you know, maybe 100. It's it's really hard number to find out. And I, I saw on the, is it EAA, correct, on their website, you can take flights in different aircraft from the past, which I thought was really, really cool. That's right. That, 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 I didn't realize the Ford Tri-Motor was the first mass-produced airliner. Another trivia, as you know where I'm going to go with this one, there, put it this way, there are probably more DC-3s from the Second World War flying than there are NAS Freelanders on the road in <laughs> North America. Couldn't miss the opportunity. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. I, I A little preview of the end of the program, I will tell you that there were more functioning Freelanders at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix than there were Discovery 1 or 2s. Ooh, mirrors. Wow. How about that? How about that for a stat for in your in your Freelander cap? <laughs> if you've called Rovers North, you should recognize the voice of our guest this month, Les Parker. Les has a long history with Land Rovers that started when he was in the British Army. He tells us about working at Rovers North, Les Loft, and the interesting Land Rovers he has driven and owned. Les, you'll hear throughout the uh, interview that uh, I say Les, and my apologies for that. He does prefer Les. Uh, Les is not retired now from Rovers North, living in Tampa, Florida. He is battling cancer and in need of a kidney transplant. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. We appreciate your support. Visit our website to see how you can support the podcast. As a Patreon supporter, you can buy. You can also buy a shirt or sticker or buy us a tee, which is just like Patreon, but you choose the amount as a uh, Bob does many months. Thanks very much, Bob. We do appreciate it. I know you're listening. And thanks for uh, buying us the brown water. I actually ran into a person at the All British Car Show in Ottawa the other weekend wearing a Center Steer podcast t-shirt. Ian Aldos. I was quite surprised. You saw one in the wild. You should have snapped a photo. 
I should have, but I didn't. This is your monthly reminder that 2023 is Land Rover's 75th anniversary year. We're inviting all Land Rover owners to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in July of 2023, exactly one year from now. Especially Series and Defender owners, we're looking at you. You have 11 months to get your Rover ready. It's not long. It really isn't long. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming up very quick. You know, everyone will have their Rovers ready because they will have gone to Greek Peak and the Jubilee Rally in mid-June in New York. So there's hope for everyone having their rowers ready for the Vintage Grand Prix. This uh, reminder that we've been doing on the podcast is working because, uh, as I will tell you at the end of the podcast, uh, we'll talk about the Vintage Grand Prix for this year. I'll give you a little preview. Scott Wickham, otherwise known as Scooter, who started the Fort Pitt Land Rover Group, the club, showed up in his Defender 90, which is an XMOD, and he said he listening to the podcast and, and telling everybody that the uh, 75th was coming up, it encouraged him to go out and get a, get himself a, a Land Rover. At least we got one person. Very nice. Excellent. So welcome back, Scooter. It's a Land Rover ownership. Scooter was rocking the Toyotas for a number of years. As uh, Dixon had mentioned, Anark has uh, selected a time and location for the Diamond Jubilee. So that'll be June 15th to the 18th of 2023 at Greek Peak Mountain Resort in Cortland, New York. And that's in the uh, southeast of the Finger Lakes regions. Details will be announced very soon. And I have invited the organizers to come on to the podcast and talk about uh, the Diamond Jubilee. And now for the news. Sales at JLR hit by computer chip shortage and lockdowns in China. And before I, re I read this, I, I you know, last month we were saying they've gotten a handle on the chips. Well, apparently they haven't. <laughs> so sales at JLR have continued to be impacted by the global chip shortage and COVID-19 lockdown in China. New figures have revealed that the automotive giant sold just over 78,800 cars in the three months to end to the end of June, which is down 37% year on year. So the June of 2023 or 2022, excuse me, compared to June of 2021, they are down 37%. British Live reports that Jaguar brand sold a little over 15,200 vehicles. That's down 48% while just over 63,600 Land Rovers were sold, a drop of 33%. In a statement, the company said its sales had continued to be constrained by the global chip shortage, compounded by the run out of the prior model Range Rover Sport, with deliveries just starting and the impact of COVID lockdown in China. Sales in the UK rose by 10% and almost 50% in Europe, but they fell 5% in China, 30% down in America, and 10% in other overseas markets. JLR said those falls reflected the, quote, transition to new models and delivery times to these markets, unquote. Wholesale volumes were 71,815 units in the period, excluding the China joint venture, down 6% compared to, compared to the previous quarter. Uh, JLR added that it continues to see strong demand for its products with global retail orders again setting new records in the quarter. It added demand for the new Range Rover, new Range Rover Sport and Defender is particularly strong with over 62,000 orders, 20,000 orders and 46,000 orders respectively. That would be 62,000 for the new Range Rover, 20,000 for the Sport and 46,000 for the Defender. So there's your sales. Things seem to be getting going well the you know just last month, but apparently uh, that is not the case. Yeah, we're still definitely in a delicate situation. <laughs> And it'll be interesting to see what uh, numbers are for July for the U.S., considering fuel prices and all of that. Because, I mean, obviously diesel prices are very high, but we don't really have many of the diesel options here. So everybody's burning or running V8s. Well, or sixes. I still think there's sixes in the... Well, uh, yes, true. There's sixes and fours, too. <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of the diesels are uh, diesel... Jags or Land Rovers are available in the U.S. at all. I don't think. Yeah, certainly not current. Well, apparently in response to the chip crisis and the general supply chain, JLR has named a former BMW exec as an industrial operations chief. So JLR has hired former BMW executive Barbara Bergmeier for a newly created role overseeing supply chains and industrial operations. Uh, Bergmeier will become executive director of industrial operations, a new division at JLR. Merging responsibilities across its manufacturing, purchasing, and supply chain, te supply chain teams, the company said. Quote, company saying here, this change consolidates accountability of the complete ecosystem of how the company produces vehicles in one place. Uh, Bergmeier, who joins JLR from Airbus Defense and Space, worked previously at BMW for nearly 25 years. 
So apparently she's well-versed in the automotive industry. Excellent. Hopefully she'll yeah. diversify where they get their chips from. Or, or, or maybe lock in longer term contracts for those chips. Cause as you're starting to realize how, how important chips were. Well, if there's going to be lockdowns in production lines, contracts aren't going to help. You need to have more than one source. You need to have uh, several sources. Yeah. That, I, I, right. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and even, you know, while a lot of chips are produced in, in China right now, sort of the biggest producer of, of the, you know, most dense chips is TSM uh, and they're in Taiwan, you know, they're still in that same region and affected similarly. You also have to now worry about uh, China doing some saber rattling around Taiwan too. What would that mean uh, if they were to forcibly retake the, what they claim to be its own uh, part of its own country? Did I say that delicately? Exactly. No. Yeah, yeah. I think what I just said will get us banned in China. <laughs> I don't. I don't even know if we have any Chinese listeners. I've never. I've never heard uh, or nor seen any indication that we do. But uh, I think that statement right there would get you. Would get us bleep. And this is a weird story. Uh, I'll just read it. I put it on here because it involves JLR and and it apparently has happened back in November, which this came from Hot ninety seven News dot com. Why Cliff John and Land Rover CEO had a great time apparently last night. November 15th, I assume of 2021, uh, Wycliffe Jean uh, joined a few others for the Range Rover Leadership Summit. According to TMZ, the event only lasts for one day and involves bigwigs from JLR North America. Aside from seminars and speeches, the summit also has parties and special guests, including Wycliffe, who was there to perform. The party got interesting when CEO and President Joe Eberhardt hopped on Wycliffe's shoulders. As Wycliffe was placing him back on his feet, the CEO accidentally fell on his head. And there is video of this, and he, in fact, did that. He's up on his shoulders, and he's going down. He looks like he hits his head. It happened. Uh, it's Land Rover related, <laughs> so I figured we'll tell you about it. <laughs> and where is Harold to go and make his comments that this would reflect some of Land Rover's marketing decisions on North America? I, I think you've just substituted <laughs> admirably. <laughs> Next, uh, Consumer Reports doesn't recommend a single Land Rover SUV, which I'm sure our listeners are shocked to hear. Uh, you can read the whole article yourself. I want to pull out one uh, aspect of it. This is around Defenders and Discoveries. Uh, and it's all for the all for the usual reasons, as you can might imagine. Reliability, drivability, sustainability, all the abilities. But for the Defender and Discovery, controls are unintuitive and distracting to the driver. However, the Discovery uniquely suffers from second-row seats that feel too low and have awkward access to its third row. Meanwhile, the Defender's braking, agility, step-in height, fuel economy, and rear visibility could be much better. Compared to other models that reach six figures in their upper trims, the Defender falls very short. And that's according to Consumer Reports, which it's good to hear things, especially about like getting in and out of the vehicle. You know, they are working to have the third row seats, but you know, if it's... Uh, not as easy to get in and out of, uh, that is a, that can be a problem. Yeah. And what uh, model years was that for? I'm going to say that was for current model years because earlier in this, it says they were referring to Consumer Reports recommends a wide variety of models. For example, the 2022 Buick Envision is at the top of the ranks, but also recommends the Porsche Macan, the Acura RDX, Infiniti QX50, and the BMW X3. So I assume it's cur generally current model years. Oh, oh, no, no, wait a minute. Land Rover yeah. offers three vehicles in the luxury segment. They are the 2022 Land Rover Velar, Discovery Sport, and the Evoque. Okay, so that's it sounds like it's current model, basically. And I believe Consumer Reports actually buys the vehicles. They don't get donated ones, so they yeah. actually buy them. So that's right. make, make more sense. It would be a 2022. Yeah, absolutely. Not to go on too much of a tangent, but sometimes I'd like to see consumer reports take something like accessing the third row seat and say, well, what? how about if we care, um, contrasted this to a checker marathon from the 1960s, which had fantastic accessibility everywhere in the back of the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, they can be a little bit too harsh at times. Well, I think what you're saying is, is that in the past, some of the 
features and abilities were easier, but as there have been other requirements put on vehicles, some of those, shall we say, comfort or featured things are more difficult because of additional requirements that are now. Oh, you couldn't build some of those cars anymore. No, 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 no. But I think that's what. <laughs> but I think that's what I'm. I think I'm hearing you saying is. But it's tough, yes. It's tough to compare apples to oranges at this point. Yeah, and I think that when they compare, you know, like the Defender with some of the other SUVs, you know, while the Defender is still a large vehicle uh, and not particularly great gas mileage in the grand scheme of things, they're probably comparing to an Escalade or something in terms of third row seat access. I didn't look into the detail of the Consumer Reports article, but that's, yeah. I mean, they're comparing current vehicles that are mass produced and, you know, how much you're paying for it and what you're getting. They're, they're ma- basically making a decision purely based on, you know, cost and value. Maybe value is probably the better word to use there on value. At least that's 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 my impression of their of their assessments. Yeah, yeah, that's that's certainly their their goal. So there are certain other aspects which obviously like the the sort of controls access that they you know are not a huge fan of. You know, some of that stuff is general design things that they may not take into the same consideration, which I'm sure Jerry McBurn would. <laughs> well, I, I think it was up to Jerry. There'd be probably no controls. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, moving on, a class action alleges defective windshields, windscreens for our British listeners, on 2020 and 2022 Land Rover Defenders. Two plaintiffs are bringing a class action lawsuit against JLR North America, based on allegations of defective windshields on the 2020-2022, a lot of 20s, Defender vehicles. According to court documents filed at the end of June 2022, it is alleged that Land Rover knew that Defenders contained one or more defects in the way the vehicles are manufactured and or made that can cause the windshield to crack, chip, and or fracture. According to the complaint, Land Rover would have known of the alleged defect through production design, failure mode, and analysis data, early consumer complaints, and more. According to the complaint, a replacement windshield can cost more than $2,000 American. If JLR is an ISO 9000 certified company, when they did all this pre-production stuff, they would note the these flaws. There would be paperwork to show that they were correcting it. And the lawsuits alleging that they went and produced the vehicle anyway, despite finding these flaws, I, I, I find that very hard to believe. There could be something wrong with it, but this is suggesting that they knew about it and deliberately did something, which I find uh, not very believable. Car companies would never do that. <coughs> Volkswagen. <laughs> that's that's a, a software cheat, which is a whole different discussion. Uh, but they knowingly did something, and you said they would not knowingly yeah. produce a uh, manufacturer. You'd be surprised would not manufacture a vehicle knowingly doing something. That's a good hack. I admit it, it was a good, great hack. I think that today, okay, they might want to go play games with software, but a windshield, I, I find that one hard to believe because just the warranty claims and so on would just cause them way too much in the way of a headache. You, you just wouldn't do that. I, I remind you, I my Freelander went through four windscreens. Four. <laughs> Four. Thank you for that honest admission. And um, it was not uh, my doing, sir. I, I, I personally believe it. It would. It. I believe that the tension. Not, Freelander is cursed. I believe anything. I personally believe it, it was, was a witch. I personally believe I'm going to continue until I can get it out. I personally believe it was because there was not enough spacing around the windscreen when you heated it up because anytime right after I used it and used the heated windscreen portion, it see that's when you would get a crack directly in the middle at the top. So I think the, I suspect that the heat caused to the windscreen to expand didn't have enough room to move and maneuver and cracked. I went through four of them. Wow. I like, Oh, you go all summer. I go off road. I come to the, uh, the birthday party, bounce around on the trail. Fine. Go back home. Winter comes around, frosted uh, windshield, hit the button, and with, shortly thereafter, hey, look, there's a crack again. That's my personal experience. I'm not saying that was all Freelanders. <laughs> <laughs> For any any of our Land Rover friends listening, I you know, hey, I still love that vehicle, as you well know, but I went through four windscreens <laughs> and five rear main seals. We should move on. <laughs> well, yes. and, and before we move on, Land Rover loves using aluminum for their vehicles, I really think they should just 
bite the bullet and go with transparent aluminum for all the windows. Ooh, there we go. They should develop transparent <laughs> aluminum. <laughs> they actually already have. Is there is there a transparent aluminum? Oh yes, they actually. That was something they actually figured out how to do. All right, we'll put you on uh, transparent aluminum watch. Sounds good. Uh, next up, Europe now requires all new cars to have anti speed mo- anti speeding. Monitors. I'm going to read the whole article. It's not too long, but the European Union officially adopted a mandate Wednesday, which would have been early July, requiring all new vehicles sold in the EU to include technology that could prevent drivers from speeding when activated. Called Intelligent Speed Assistance, the tech uses different methods to detect the speed limit on any given road that a vehicle is traveling on. The primary means to detect the posted speed limit of any roadway is to use the vehicle's outward-facing cameras. However, the regulations all uh, also call for ISA to utilize map data and deep learning in case the speed limit cannot be determined from a sign. ISA regulations say that if a vehicle speeds on any road, the system, when activated, must warn the driver or even automatically slow down the vehicle until the it reaches the posted speed limit. Automakers can implement passive or direct methods to adhere to posted speed limits. For passive warnings, the vehicle may sound an auditory alert or gently caution the driver with a vibration in the steering wheel. For a more direct approach, automakers can choose to use the accelerator pedal to gently lift the uh, driver's foot or ensure that speed is automatically gently reduced by the vehicle's software. For now, there are ways around the systems. Namely, drivers will be able to override the tech. The European Road and Safety Charter says that drivers will be able to countermand the speed limiter by applying further pressure on the accelerator. If the system becomes too cumbersome, the vehicle operator may also have the ability to disable the system completely. Those overrides are critical now because a vehicle systems may not always perceive the correct speed limit on the road. For example, a damaged or vandalized road sign may cause the vehicle to improperly read a speed limit. Uh, Likewise, weather conditions could cause cameras to be unusable to read a road sign. If these reasons uh, that the EU has called ISA a, quote, best effort driver assistance system, unquote, and maintains that the driver is responsible for adhering to relevant traffic laws. As of July 2024, all new vehicles sold in the EU must be equipped with ISA. The European Commission says that excessive speed contributed to nearly 30% of all fatal crashes and hopes that the new speed-related safety mandate, system mandate, will significantly cut down on those figures as newer vehicles become more commonplace on the road. Boy, the lawsuits are going to be absolutely incredible. So you can't go and race someone to the hospital in an emergency. And does this mean that in shades of the John Deere lawsuit and with software like Vagcom and so on, you can't go and re- reprogram the ECU to go and take all of this nonsense out? This will, this will be fascinating to watch. Yeah, your, your point about John Deere and the right to repair movement, that's going to be very interesting to watch for sure. And, you know, while... Speed is definitely a contributing factor in very high percentage of accidents in the U.S. as well. It's still, like you said, there's yeah. there's some safety concerns with not being able to to speed as well. And generally, it's difference in speed that causes the accidents because you've got some people that are going you know way too slow on roads, and it, it's a whole tangential uh, discussion. But it it'll be interesting to to follow this one and see what happens. So what you're saying, Dixon, is that we, it also needs to be, be able to detect that you're going too slow and then move you up to the posted speed limit. Well, there are minimum <laughs> minimum speeds on a lot of the uh, interstates and, and highways and so on. Oh, that's true. And so this will slow you down when you get to school zones, and it, it'll be uh, quite fascinating to, to see this implemented. And, and some of that is not, not all bad either. I mean, you know, being at, forcibly slowing down a vehicle in a school zone, there's nothing, see, little concern there because that's a smart thing to do you should be going slow in a school zone you know as a bureaucrat why would i want to slow the car down i would want to go and have the have the system you know automatically use the cellular network to go and print out a, a fine and, and have it mailed to the person let them speed that could very this well be a new generation <laughs> well that that could be on the list there too that could very be possible but this is a way though to uh, mitigate the problem versus uh, assign some sort of punishment, which hof- hopefully then mitigates the problem. So this is a way to mitigate the problem as it happens. My concern being a, in information security is um, as cars become more connected to, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi and the 
and the uh, internets and uh, such. Can a police officer behind you, and this is good and bad, you know, you're speeding or you're, you know, considered a possibly a, you know, a vehicle involved in a crime. Could they hit a button and stop the car? And if the police can do it, that means the system can be hacked and someone else can do it. Yes. There's, there's my information security hat. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. It's like, uh, Oh, wait a minute. If they can do it, uh, what's the stop of, you know, the, what's the stop the, the Russians before they invade from stopping all cars. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? Does that get us banned in Russia? Oh, just the anarchists <laughs> in North America could do it. Yeah. All to buy old Land Rovers, right? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> they could We're just safe. require that. And you know, nobody would be able to exceed, exceed the speed limit anyway. <laughs> think this is all going to get over, eclipsed in i don't know if it's going to be five years or it's probably more like 20 years but it'll all be eclipsed by self-driving vehicles they'll eventually will work and they will happen and they will do a decent job probably better than most humans are and you'll just get in some box that takes you to where you need to go and it goes the appropriate speed limit and then it'll be us outliers driving our old series trucks and <laughs> anti-speed anti-speeding monitors coming in Europe and very possibly might uh, come to the U S because there's, there's a lot of times there's an exchange of those regulatory ideas. Although I think the U S would take a long time before that were to happen. You'll have a solar powered car and we'll put, we'll, we'll go and make a cloud. So it slows you down. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Which is nice transition to the next story. Fully charged drives the Lightyear Zero solar car for the first time. What does that mean? This is Inside EVs. We've been excited about the Lightyear One, now called the Lightyear Zero, for many years, ever since it was first announced in 2019, the prospect of having a massive solar array that takes up every single out upward facing square inch of the body in order to provide meaningful free additional range, essentially requiring you to charge less or even maybe not at all, really has us intrigued and wanted to materialize. So this, uh, so has this ambitious startup delivered on its promises, and does the Lightyear Zero justify its hefty price tag starting at 149,000 euros? According to this video, which I think is about 20 minutes long, the answer should be an emphatic yes. The vehicle is very impressive technically, and there's nothing else like it available from any automaker. The Lightyear is not a sporty vehicle, as its main focus is to drive for as long as possible using as few electrons as possible, and on that front it certainly delivers. It really wants you to drive it efficiently all the time. One cool feature that you can actually see how much power each individual solar panel is producing while on the move, and you can even tell which direction the sun is shining from uh, based purely on that graphic. I brought this article up because Dixon and I are having an offline conversation uh, about uh, putting solar panels on the vehicle because I have a flat roof on the top of my 110. That'd be kind of cool to put a bunch of solar panels up there. So it sounds like someone's been working on it, Dixon. Yes. There's actually a company in British Columbia, I think it's Cascadia, that makes solar panels that stick onto your the bonnet or the, the roof of vehicles and so on for so to keep solar fridges and other low powered things charged. Toyota had solar panels in the roofs of Priuses for a period there that would, you know, be able to run fans and, and stuff to keep the interior slightly cooler on a hot day. But yeah, nobody's really been been pushing it far enough in terms of actually powering the drive brain of the vehicle or or no, you know, the, the battery source for the, <laughs> the drivetrain. But it's nice to see someone's at least thinking about it and, and trying, even if it's just a prototype and quite expensive, that's, that's going to help drive that because it just makes sense. Doesn't it? It just, you got some upward surface, a lot of sunshine in many places, even if you can eke out an extra couple miles, you know, it's free energy. Even right? if it sits in the parking lot. Oh, even better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You're not, you're not moving. Right. <laughs> Sit in the parking lot. Next, the Land Rover Range Rover Velar spied hiding mild mid-cycle refresh. This is from Motor One. Land Rover launched the all-new Range Rover late this last year, updating the SUV's design platform technology. Next to go under the knife is the Velar. The company launched it in 2017, and the model is getting a mid-cycle refresh that our spy photographers caught hot weather testing in southern Europe. The SUV only has camouflage covering the front and rear fascias, which isn't hiding much at first glance. The grill looks unchanged, and Land Rover's hiding the headlights, which are likely receiving new internals. The Velar's front bumper also looks unchanged, matching the Velar S's styling with its recessed intakes and smaller lo uh, lower grille opening. There's less going on with the rear, which is also covered in a wrap. However, we can't spot any significant changes. Land Rover is likely updating the taillights design and massaging the bumper into a new shape. 
There aren't any photos of the Velar's interior, but we don't expect any big updates. Land Rover could give the model its latest infotainment technology. Uh, this is the first time we've spotted the Velar out testing, so it could be a while before the official reveal. Land Rover's already advertising the 2023 Velar on its consumer site. So we don't expect any model updates until 2024 model year, which means probably won't, it might debut early in 2023. So that's your Velar Series 2. Sounds nice. I want to bring back adding Series to the end of the... So it should be like, you know, Defender Series 5. No, new Defender... Wait, Defender Series 2? What would Actually, well, yeah, it would be Defender Series 2, right? We had pretty much one Defender for 30 years. So really, the new one should be called Series 2. I know, move on. <laughs> Yeah, another preview of uh, going to the Vintage Grand Prix. They had the new Range Rover there, and they and on the bill of sale on this uh, the tells you all the details of the vehicle on that label. It says new Range Rover, <laughs> which helped me to identify that it was in fact the new one because it looks a lot like the old one. So, what does a fully loaded Range Rover cost? I like the you know guessing game. Just uh, I'll, I'll give you one guess. Uh, this is the ba- the base one, the ba- the base entry level, the one that I saw, which was the uh, was a white Range Rover. I assume it was the I don't think it was autobiography. It was just a standard Range Rover. Hundred thousand. Hmm. For the base model, I'd guess more like ninety five. It you both right. It was hundred thousand, and this one had twenty thousand <laughs> in extras. Twenty thousand wow. in extras. Speaking, oh, nice, nice. Well done again, Dixon, for the transition. I appreciate it because our next story is how much does a fully loaded 2023 Range Rover cost? The 2023 Land Rover Range Rover is uh, already available for purchase. It offers buyers several trim levels and three body styles, standard wheelbase, long wheelbase, and seven-seater long wheelbase. Anyone looking for the epitome of opulence can option their ride for fully loaded 2023 Range Rover. But how much with all the bells and whistles? Uh, below is a brief overview of the ultra luxury SUV, a breakdown of the costs, and you can read the article fully for yourself. I'll give you some highlights. Uh, Land Rover offers three powertrains. The most potent is a 523 horsepower twin turbo V8, while the least powerful is the inline six with 48 volt hybrid uh, hybrid system producing 395 horsepower. And in the middle is a 434 horsepower plug-in hybrid. It has standard air suspension, In addition, the seating is configurable. Shoppers can choose from four, five, or seven seat arrangements. However, it is dependent on the on the body style. Last, the dashboard has a 13.1 inch infotainment screen and a 13.7 inch digital gauge display. Screens for the back seats are available for an upcharge. The SV Trim's long wheelbase version is the most expensive 2023 Range Rover model. It starts at $161,600. Standard features include everything available with the autobiography trim, such as privacy glass, sliding panoramic roof, automatic headlights, headlight leveling, and acoustic laminate windscreen. Also, this model comes with the only V8 engine. The cost immediately jumps to $218,000 with SV styling. There are also other options such as deployable side steps, wheel protection pack, and an emergency pack. According to Land Rover's build estimates, adding the most extent expensive extras to the long wheelbase SV could drive the total for a fully loaded 2023 Range Rover to almost $280,000. Ouch. The SE models are the most affordable in the lineup. <laughs> they're also the most fuel efficient thanks to their hybrid powertrains. However, they're not as luxurious as their higher price siblings, and you don't get the non seven seater extended wheelbase options. The range topping first edition and SV trims offer the highest luxury and styling. Coming to premium, Car and Driver recommends the autobiography trims instead. They're right in the middle in terms of cost and give you access to the optional luxury features. So there's your answer, Dixon. How much does a fully <laughs> new Range Rover cost? <laughs> Yeah, but the one I saw was, I think, 120. The poverty edition. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Next, Land Rover Defender 90 2022 long term review from Auto Car. I will let you read the article yourself. I just wanted to point out one or two things. Most unforgivably of all, the rear seats don't fold flat, alienating a co- core target market of owners who like to travel with their dogs in cages. Just last week, a reader sent me a link to a video to fix this problem. The solution so simple that Land Rover could implement it in a jiffy if it chose. The suspicion must be that it would rather push you to buy a pricier 110. A surprising number of people have written to tell me that they just shopped elsewhere instead. So what is the quick fix? 
I didn't find that you out. Know, I didn't just see to that. remove the headrests. <laughs> I I, uh, I I don't know. I didn't look it up. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> I never actually travel with a dog crate for my dog. It would probably be a smart idea to secure the dog. I do attach it to the seatbelt to a harness. So, you yeah, know, it is secure, I, but just not. I have not a special harness for both of mine and which clips into the uh, the rear seatbelt. Yeah. And, I, you know, the just to go off on a, another tangent the the passenger areas are generally the safer area because even cargo areas are intended to be crumple zones so you're saying put you're saying put the dog in the back seat versus putting it in the into the cargo bay exactly that's right yep if you're taking your family and your dog then you need the seven seater then see then <laughs> yep. so maybe maybe they're right maybe they really want you to go to a 110 then and then you can sleep in it Oh, look at you, Dixon. Look at you. Yes. Yeah, speaking of sleeping in your 110, Land Rover Defender 110, can you sleep in it? And there is Autoblog has a, I think like a eight minute video, which was pretty interesting. And you can read about how big the back is and it all folds flat and how to do that and how much base you would have. And so if that's something that interests you, I, you know, go check that out. And then I guess the, they also referred to videos that people have to put screens on all the, what, 7,000 windows there are in the, in the 110. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good video, though. I thought they yeah. did a, a nice job, at least kind of explaining things, how big it is and what to look for. And I guess the one thing that they would like, and I think we heard this before, too, on another review, is there's no button to open the to open the rear from inside. Yeah, that's very interesting because common in a lot of SUVs, yet at the same time, you know, any vehicle with a trunk has to have emergency egress, yes. egress. Yeah, exactly. An emergency egress lever just in case. Well, I suspect that at least here in the US, I suspect that regulation covers passenger cars and not station wagons, which is what typically uh, SUVs are considered. Yeah, agreed. I just think it's a, an interesting trade-off. I call that a regulation fail. It really does make sense. You should have something to, if you're in the back there and you know, the fire happens and or for example, when you get pushed to the back of the vehicle, yeah, why not? Right, exactly. Or, you know, with the number of people who drive into lakes following their GPS to a T, you know, sometimes could be the best escape through the rear. Any of our friends who work at uh, Land Rover, take that into consideration. I'm sure it's, it's a, you already got buttons back there to raise and lower the air suspension. How about another button to release the rear hatch and... You know, even if, even if it's not automatic, you know, just at least pop it so that it's unlocks. I can do that in my one, my 87, 110. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I could have done that in the Freelander too. I think the Freelander ha had the ability to, to open because this, the, the rear window had to slide down because the window went into the body. So it would slide up and slide down, uh, even, you know, like an inch just to make that clearance. So when you opened it up, it would slide down and you could open it up. I believe you could do that from the inside if I remember correctly. So the technology exists. What's one more chip? <laughs> it sounds to me like probably a, a button and a, a line of code. Uh, one would hope, yes. Next, Land Rover Defender expert transfers to employee ownership. Twisted Automotive Group, a North Yorkshire-based Land Rover Defender specialist, has transitioned to ownership by an employee ownership trust. In a deal devised by Paul Land of Tenant Land Partners, the staff from Twisted Automotive and specialist dipping company Hydrographics will now collectively share full ownership of the business. This is designed to provide staff with a greater incentive to influence business decisions along with day-to-day -day benefits and financial awards. Twisted founder Charles Fawcett will remain in his role as managing director. Founded in Thirsk and with additional locations in Kensington, Salcombe, Silverstone, Austin, Texas, and Dubai, the Twisted Automotive Group now employs 35 staff and turned over £6 million in the year to December 2021. Wow. Nice. And then from military.com, when tank round meets Land Rover. <laughs> Uh, in case you ever wondered what would happen if you fired a tank round at a Land Rover, watch their video. They take a tank and they shoot it, uh, shoot a, a LR3, a Disco 3. If you're into that, that's your, your jam. We'll have a link there to it, of course, in the show notes. Now, I've never seen them shoot a tank round at one of the like armored Range Rovers that they produced. They're probably just way too expensive to waste yes. <laughs> on that. Uh, it would be interesting nonetheless. 
about. I, there was a story that I, I didn't include this month about a the British Prime Minister has a uh, armored Range Rover with an escape hatch and all that. I think we've seen that story before, but it's funny you mentioned that, that you're right. Take, take that, that and shoot it and see what happens. And finally, Oxford in America, Episode 7, has debuted, and this is from uh, David Short and Rove. You may recall Oxford was in America. I hope, hope I'm sure most of our listeners uh, re- recall that fondly. And uh, episode seven, David's been busy with his uh, real life. Uh, so I think that's why there's been a little delay in getting out uh, episodes. Uh, this is a good one. Although <laughs> in typical David Short fashion, sir, you buried the lead. We almost lost Oxford, burned to the ground type of uh, losing Oxford. So I encourage you to go out and check that video. I think it was about 12 minutes, uh, 11, yeah, 11 and a half minutes. And the Oxford drives through Southern California or through California into Southern California and experiences wildfires that took place uh, back in 2021, right? That was a lot. Was that a year ago? Two years ago. Two years ago. So, you know, David, uh, David kind of buried that lead there that the, they were going, they were supposed to go to a campground, didn't go to the campground. And then we find out later that all the campers at that campground had to be va- evacuated via helicopter. Yeah, I vaguely recall that he uh, he sort of buried the lead on that when when he chatted about it with us not long after it happened as well. Probably in some ways, <laughs> probably rightfully so. You don't want to cause a concern amongst the community, right? Yes, certainly. While the trip was in progress, I agree completely. Well, look forward to episode eight. Uh, when David gets to that. So thank you very much, David, for continuing to get the videos out about Oxford in America. And that's the news for July of 2022. Knightsbridge Overland Seat Covers help protect your classic Land Rover, whether you're on the trail or cruising around town. They're the perfect solution for protecting your pristine Land Rover seats or to cover up your well-worn and aged seats. Each seat cover is hand-cut and sewn in the USA for a custom fit that looks like it's straight from the factory. Every seat cover is crafted using 600 denier Cordera material. It's waterproof, oil, and dust-resistant. And that's something I can attest to because i got a stain on mine. <laughs> I like to eat cherries. Ooh. Yeah, I like to eat cherries, especially as I'm driving. It's easy to do. And I think a cherry pit got on the seat put a little cherry stain on the seat cover. I contacted John over at Knightsbridge Overland and said to do a little pre-treat, use a brush and with some detergent, it should come right out. And it did. After rinsing it, I had a watermark and I said, John, there's a water stain on it. Can I throw this in the into the clothes wash? And he goes, oh yeah, you can do that. But I have had mine for seven, eight years on my truck. I've never had to wash mine. And my reply was, uh, you don't leave your windows open all the time while you're driving in your Defender probably. <laughs> so you can throw them in the, in the washer. Don't dry them. Uh, you don't want to put them into the dryer, but you can leave them hang to dry. Um, and I remember helping you install the the front seat base covers from them. And they're pretty easy to put on. And I imagine probably just as easy to take back off. The hardest thing is not hitting yourself in the face with the headrest as you sit in the back seat and have to pull that headrest up because it, it, there's no button. You just have to pull on it and you got to pull up, but you can't go too far because there's a there's a roof and you can't hit yourself in the head and the chin. So that's the hardest part. Seat covers are easy. <laughs> Knightsbridge Overland seat covers are designed to be extremely comfortable and keep you warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer while providing protection against mud, dirt, grime, and more. Knightsbridge Overland seat covers are available for most Land Rovers, including Series, Defender, Discovery, and Range Rover. Select the Knightsbridge Overland seat cover that's right for your Rover. Available in both tactical and non-tactical versions in four colors, black, tan, mocha, and gray. Our tactical seat covers include military-grade Moly webbing that accommodates pouches, weapons, tools, first aid kits, and more. Non-tactical seat covers feature three handy pockets for much-needed extra storage in your Land Rover. Visit KnightsbridgeOverland.com and enter STEER10, S-T-E-E-R, the number 10, at checkout for 10% off your Knightsbridge Overland seat cover order. That's KnightsbridgeOverland.com. Enter STEER10 for 10% off your order. Protect and enhance your Land Rover seats with Knightsbridge Overland. And now welcome to the Center Steer podcast all the way from Tampa, Florida. Les Parker, Les, you are the voice of Rovers North, the one-time keeper of the loft and a retired employee of Rovers North. So welcome to the podcast, Les. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, hopefully we can get some uh, information out and about to the folks that are 
sparing their free time and listening to us. <laughs> well, not only do we want to get information about Land Rovers, we're going to get information out about you. I don't know whether people want to know all about that, but anyway. Les has some uh, health concerns that we'll, we'll address to later in the podcast. And uh, But before we get to that, Les, you're known as the, the, the voice of Rovers North. Anytime anybody calls in to order a part or gather some information from Rovers North, you were the one that answered the call. And you retired, I think, about, what, two or three years ago? Actually, it's, it's been five years ago. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, your, vo- your, voice is still, your voice is still on the, the, the answering machine, right? That's right. Yes, we, we we did a bit of a project for for um, Rovers North, the evolution from the bicycle, the Rover bicycle, way back uh, up until Land Rover, really up up until the eighties when uh, it was quite an interesting project to do. Found a lot of information out, uh, and uh, if anybody's got half an hour to spare and just be put on hold at Rovers North, they can listen to the whole. Oh, I'll sing. Is, is there a special menu button for that story? <laughs> no, just be, just has to be put on hold, and you'll get. <laughs> it's an off the menu selection, John. Well, how did you become voice of Rovers North? How long did you uh, work for Rovers North? I joined Rovers North in 1995, and uh, I retired there in 2017. So I was there for 22 years. Wow. That's a good run. But when you started in 95, uh, how did you start out? I started, actually, I, I was in, in, enlisted or, or um, I joined the company to, to help with inventory and stuff like that. Um, I had a lot of in-depth knowledge of Discovery Ones and uh, the early defenders and that. And these were just starting to come over to North America. And I, as I say, I had a lot of in-depth knowledge of uh, componentry and, and inventory information. So I joined on that scale, on the inventory, and evolved really into uh, being on phone sales and tech support. I, I still get a, a few customers who through their own, um, what would you say? You know, they, they found me. <laughs> they tracked you down? <laughs> Hunted you down. down. Tracked me down, and I do still get tech calls from time to time. So uh, that's okay. I don't mind doing that. Something feels so much more authentic about it when speaking with somebody who speaks English as opposed to new English when you call other people up there. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the terminology, you might say, yes. Did you spend all your time in Vermont while you worked for Rovers North? I traveled around a bit. Uh, I mean, uh, I went to various rallies around the country. I was lucky enough to go as far as the Northeast, uh, sorry, the Northwest Challenge over in Washington. Uh, that was quite a, uh, an interesting trip. And we did the MAR. We did that a few times. And of course, the bridge invasion. And um, I came down to Florida a couple of times and did the Florida rallies. Um, I went over to do the SCAR on one occasion and also the Arkansas uh, rally. I, I covered that as well. So I, I got to meet, and I always enjoy going out to rallies to meeting customers and, and finding, you know, each state has its own unique ground and you know obviously the rovers are adapted to suit that ground are you an off-roader i not currently because <laughs> Florida hasn't got much really um challenging stuff um you know they've got a lot of mud if you go into the state forests and things like that but not to the extent of uh, mar and scar and all those other ones that uh, have tremendous um opportunities for off-roading. Did you get a chance to off-road at those events? I did. I certainly did. I got to drive and my little 90 that I built many years ago is still set up as an off-road vehicle. What year is that? That's uh, an ex-military. It's a 1987 ex-military, normally aspirated as was. It's now got the 300 TDI in it. Um, That's all set up for off-roading. and uh, Good choice. that it's not one that I off-road down here. We, we still have some land up in Cabot, Vermont, and that, that's what it was built for, really. It was to help me do the logging in the woods up in Cabot. So it's been retired from that. That's the same as I have, really. Do you know what that uh, 90 did with the Ministry of Defense? 
It was um, belonged to the Royal Military Police uh, in its day. It was originally a radio truck, um, and I, I sort of moved all that off and made, made it more civilianized. So it's now a full soft top. Um, and all the military bodywork, which was um, uh, very carefully reshaped by the military in uh, various guises, you know, the odd battle scar here and there. Um, Custom bodywork. <laughs> that's, that's a good way of putting it, yes, yes. And it was quite interesting when I started to take the dash apart and all underneath the seats, and it, it gave you some idea of its history with all the odd coins that were there and um there's money in every land rover you take apart <laughs> and, and you know shells and this sort of thing from active duty so uh, i guess it got around a bit in its day did you ever do the uh, get the history of it i forget the form that the, is it the v5 or something i didn't the um wrote off the british heritage uh, in Ga- in Gaden, and they gave me a history of its um, military history, and also you can go on to RL archives because um, it's a late enough mm. car. Actually, if, if if you know the military registration number, the Merlin uh, database is online now. You can go to a website and just punch it in and see it right away. Oh, well, that told me it was it was assigned to the Royal Military Police over in Germany, and uh, didn't oh. give me. You know, it didn't give me any units, really. That's that's the history, as far as I know of it. Interesting. How long have so you had, how long have you had that truck? Uh, I've had that about fifteen years. So it's one I sort of uh, rebuilt, and the only thing that's really original on it now is is the chassis and the bulkhead. Everything else has been changed. Usually, those are the things you change first. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the only original thing that's left on it now. Wow. Have you named it? it? It's it's funny. It's the Mont registration number was number nine space T E A, and <laughs> if they'd been to the rallies, they'd have seen ninety. Um, and I had to explain, unfortunately, to a few people what the registration number meant. But, uh, <laughs> but in fact, it's registered in Florida, unfortunately, because it's a. Uh, uh, a vintage car. I don't get to choose what the plate is. So, nine T has been retired. But the name lives on. It does. It does. I, I don't know whether I've got a plate here. Actually. I've still kept. I've had to send one of the plates back to Vermont, but I did keep one of them. So you got to go around to different events then for in in work as working as an employee of Rovers North, and and you got to off road your own vehicle. Uh, did you get to drive anything interesting? Uh, any uh, any near death experiences? <laughs> Fish fishing for good stories. A side of safety, uh, so <laughs> not very real ones. I did see when we were up in the Northwest Challenge a really nice ninety station wagon that had been converted to three hundred TDI, and that went up um, like a nearly a vertical cliff driving upwards, but unfortunately it hit a boulder and that caused it to do four, I think, complete rollovers and absolutely crushed it. And thankfully it did have the roll cage on it and that saved the occupants. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was it was quite startling to see what happened. There was doors flying off and glass all over the place. It was It was quite a tragic sight, but thankfully the two guys walked out of it, which was quite remarkable. That is. There was a time at Mar, and this was not at Pearl's Pond. It was at down by the James River, though, and a uh, Series 3 had gone up this steep hill. It was inches, inches away from cresting and making it up the hill, and it just didn't have enough juice, and it rolled back, and it was fine. It, nothing happened, but everybody held their breath while I was on the way down. Cause you thought it was, you know, was he going to go sideways? It, but it just, it went back at speed yeah. directly back and then made a slight turn to the left as it went down. And it, it was perfectly fine. Everybody cheered. Not only, not only did it go down without hitting something, it parallel parked itself between two trees. That's right. Oh That's me. Yeah, and that by the guy. way, John, that was the bean field mar over in the other end of the state. What other uh, rallies uh, did you get to or uh, have have you made uh, that uh, stand out to you? 
The MAR when it was flooded, I remember that. And, uh, <laughs> we, Which one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we took the company Discovery down and uh, had a raised air intake on it. And we, we, we sort of tried, and, well, we did drive it through the river, um, but it conked out on the other side. <laughs> oh. It took a, a day and a half to get it all dried out again to get it started again because that was our that was our method home so we had to get it fixed. But, uh, that was quite an experience that was. That was absolutely when it was flooded. Right, oh, it was awful. I, I, that's that was that was a long time ago. That, as you say, that was down by the James River there, and everything got swamped and it was like i think the campsite was an island yes that's right and it was uh, very treacherous to get in and out of it e- even with that paved section it was still treacherous mar returns to pearl's pond this year oh really yes they're not going to the other one no, no, not 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 uh... no they're not going back to the uh, previous location in giles county uh they're going back to pearl's pond rove is currently working to update trails cut new trails and uh, so it will be back and it's a, it's a hunt and ride club now. And there is a nice pavilion that's been uh, put up on the site. And so that'll be nice. Uh, there's different land, but the same land, I think it just kind of shifted a bit is my understanding. Uh, and there he says right now they're cutting trails uh, about once a month. Oh, brilliant. Did you make it to the Greek peak for the, for the 50th anniversary event? I did not. I did not. I didn't. I didn't. I can't remember what I was doing at that time, but unfortunately, I can't. I, I didn't make it. I know. I, I went to UK, actually. I went to the 50th anniversary at uh, Pete, not, not Peterborough. It's the one before that, Billings. And that was quite interesting to see uh, Dunsfold Land Rovers with all their paraphernalia. And uh, they, they, they certainly rolled out a good load of stuff there fantastic collection of Land Rovers that they have on hand. That was very interesting to see that. And, you know, it is a very well-packed out, well-attended thing. That, that's why I didn't make that the other one, but yeah. uh, that, that was quite quite a trip. It's a good excuse. I wrote up actually in the Rovers North magazine about that one. While working at uh, Rovers North, you, you, know, you were not only doing inventory, but you were kind of helping out folks with uh, technical tips. Uh, any of those that stand out to you? I, I suspect that they probably have, te- you know, stand the test of time and are still relevant. Some of them, <clears throat> I'm, I, I don't like to give out sort of some of the things that I've had to guide people through because they might feel embarrassed by how simple the fix was really, but. You can anonymize it. You don't have to say who it was. <laughs> <laughs> or their home address or their phone number. What one stands out, actually. It's, it's, it's one that involved my wife. Um, she was driving our Discovery 1 with my mother-in-law, and uh, they were down in Montpellier. For some reason, well, the passenger's door didn't get shut properly. And, and, and my wife, Annie, she armed the car and walked away. Everything was fine come back to the car, unlocked it, and uh, couldn't start it. It would crank, but it wouldn't start. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's bizarre, you know. So anyway, and he says, oh, I'll just call Les, he'll fix it. And mother-in-law says, how could he fix it from up there? You know, he, he, he just can't do that. Uh, anyway, and he calls me up and says, told me what the problem was. I said, did you close all the doors? He said, no, well, no. So opened and closed all the doors, went to the driver's door, you know, lock and unlock it four times to reset the alarm and put the key back in the ignition and off it went. You know, that was a, a, a feather in my cap because up to that point, my mother-in-law thought I was a, a lunatic for messing about with Land Rovers. She realized my, my worth at that point. And <laughs> <laughs> it certainly helped me out. <laughs> that, that was early on in my 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 relationship with Annie and uh, it, it went well, you know. So that was, that worked out okay. Excellent. So that's one and um, another time, I was talking to somebody and he said he was driving and you know this shouldn't happen anyway, but he was driving and talking to me at the same time. I think he had the phone on speaker in between two front seats and he's driving along, and he said it's sounding really rough this series vehicle. He says, it's not just coming right at all, you know. And he says, well, what do you think I should do? And he says, oh, hang on a minute, I'll have to call you back. And I said, why, what's happening? And then there was an almighty crash 
because apparently he had gone through the traffic lights and somebody had sideswiped him. Oh. <laughs> and I went, what happened? <laughs> somebody just hit me. Oh. <laughs> I went, uh. I'll have to call you back. I'll call you back. I'll call you back. And, uh, you know, he did call mm. me back about an hour later. And I said, yeah, okay. And he went, I'm okay. The rover isn't, but, you know, I'm okay. That that was quite a, a moment. I don't know whether that, you know, that's a technical num- moment or not, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, well, it's a story. It, it did solve his problem by the necessitating the replacement of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Uh, it running rough was the least of his worries at that point. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a tip or a fix that comes to mind that is like the, the biggest one that people call about that folks have trouble with, whether it's, you know, needing a, you know, needing a new part or, you know, cycling for the security on the D1? Well, the, the cycling for the D1s used to be a big thing. I think a lot of people have disarmed the alarm now, so that doesn't happen so often. But one of the biggest things is when people do a tune-up and get the plug wires ran the wrong way, and one of the wires aren't running right, you know, and and you point out, I says, well, if you looked at the inlet manifold, it gives you the fire in order right there. I says, all you got to do is look at the inlet manifold. And they said, well, oh, yeah, I see it now. And how many people who've owned these cars for years don't look at the inlet manifold to see what the fire order is? But they don't expect to see it there. uh, Well, there's that, plus they have to understand which cylinder is number one. Well, that's true. Do you start from the front or the back? You know, that's the next question. I said, well, where do you think you start? The front or the back? The biggest joy I have is is when I'm talking to people about technical stuff is try and get them to work it out as you're going along. You know, what have you done so far? You know, if, if, you know, some people, they've tuned it up and then they forget to put the rotor arm in or something like that. Oh, yeah. Wonder why it doesn't run. Oh, Uh, yeah. You know, silly little things like that that is easily overlooked. But you talk to them and say, "Well, what did you do? You know, and where, where did you know where did it start going wrong? And what happened here?" And the 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 light bulb suddenly clicks on, and they worked it out themselves. To get them to do the thought process of how to diagnose something, then they can work it out next time themselves, and it helps helps I think in the long term. So some of our listeners that have been around for a little while will remember Les's Loft. But Les, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Les's Loft was a, an idea that came up to move some, some static inventory, if you like. It was inventory that had, had sat for a little while, but a lot of folks would find it very interesting. Uh, one of the first ones I did was a complete dashboard Often an early 2A, which is absolutely complete and absolutely mint. And I'm sure that it'd be worth a lot more money now than what it sold when that was launched. But we we um, used to regularly find bits and pieces that hadn't moved for a little while and try and sort of do a bundle or something like that to, to get to get them moving and uh, try and help folks out and, and build it in with other articles that we were doing. Like, uh, you know, if we found a like a new old stock distributor or something like that, try and do a tune up kit that went with it. You know, it, it was interesting to find all this stuff that was laid around, which is one of the reasons I came to join Rovers North was to sort the inventory out because there's a lot of stuff laid up, both new and used, that uh, hadn't moved for a long time. So I, I was working my way through the inventory and uh, trying to put the, the customer that needed it with the parts that we had. So it, it was a very interesting part of my time at Rovers North. For the most of them, remember it, they got some really good deals, actually. There were deals, but I also remember some of the stuff in there was stuff you never saw anywhere else. It was so weird. Yes, yes. I mean, we, we came across some next military stuff. I remember one um, heater kit for Arctic Land Rovers which was all the pipework and all this stuff that went around the cab area and the center seat was taken out and there was a heater put there and all these pipes went everywhere to, to warm the whole cab area up. So that was quite an interesting find. Uh, of course, when you look at something, it's just got a part number on the outside of it and a lot of folks didn't know where it went. And through my time in the British military, I could identify a lot of this stuff and what it meant. Well, that sounds like a good segue to ask how you became a Land Rover enthusiast. I take it, is it because you had uh, served in the British military? 
I did. I did serve in the British military for a while. I was uh, spent three years in UK and then three years in Germany, which was uh, quite an interesting part of my life. Uh, went on manoeuvres all over the place. We joined the uh, United States troops out in the woods, and we went as far as the uh, Iron Curtain at that point, and it was quite interesting, you know, being one side of the barbed wire fence, and there's the Russians looking at us, the other side of the fence, you know, looking at each other through binoculars. It was, <laughs> it was quite our Germany versus their Germany. Yes, yes, indeed. And you think now that, you know, all that's gone. You know, it's, it's, uh, it was quite radical, you know, to see that all go. I take it this is the, the British Army. Yes. Just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, yes, the British Army. Yes, I was, I was part of the British Army. I wasn't, I wasn't some sort of flaky guy that, uh, over there on, on suspicious activities. <laughs> was that the BAOR? Correct, yes, yes. Okay. We were based in Bielefeld. Is that British Army Overseas Reserve? Uh, British uh, Army of the Rhine. What, what was your uh, function? <sighs> Ah, that, 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 that I, I can't really get into. Okay, but, uh, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh yeah, well, he'll have to kill us if he tells us. <laughs> Is that where you were exposed to Land Rovers? Um, actually, before that, when I was in UK, before we went over there, I, I was attached to the RAF. We were part of a what they call tactical air support wing. The unit I was with, which was fully air portable, which is where we, I got introduced to Land Rovers. The thing was, our particular unit was supposed to be anywhere in the world within 24 hours. So we went to some places that uh, might be considered still sensitive, but, uh, you know, we, we were there. Um, there's one time that... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I could tell you about this one. Um, there was this one time when we went on manoeuvres in Turkey and uh, we were a radio relay station between Iraq and UK. Now, there was other relay stations as well. I mean, the, you know, satellites now, we don't need all that sort of stuff. We were a re re uh, radio relay station and we were stuck on the top of a mountain for two weeks in Turkey, uh, maintaining radio silence in two Land Rovers. And uh, we, we maintain our radio silence and we wondered when we were actually going to be reunited with our unit. And uh, we, 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 <laughs> we had a courier come by and said, you're supposed to be back in the unit 10 days ago. I said, well, we were maintaining radio silence so we were doing our job. <laughs> <laughs> we wondered what happened to you, you know? <laughs> we were doing our job. People were very friendly. <laughs> But you couldn't see us from the air, so we were, we were doing our job. Were those Land Rovers lightweights? Uh, they were. They were the first of the Series 3s, actually, and they, <laughs> they were very nice. But we, we used to get them all in nice shiny green and have the job of painting them. So, you know, we, we had fun doing that. Mm -hmm. So. Grab the, grab the broom and a can of paint. Yeah, absolutely. Get the yard brush out and give it a good old splash over here and there and mask the glass out, and mm -hmm. that was it. And when you're done, do it again. Yes. When it comes back from maneuvers, we have to go and do it all over again. So were you making them camo or darker green or? We were, we were making them camo. You know, uh, there, there wasn't a particular pattern. You know, you just made some curves and some wavy bits here and there and down kind to your arms. Kind of like the spot weld placement in the factory. This looks like a good place. Something like that. Yes, yes. We'll, we'll just weld this bit here so you can't get at it ever again. You're, you're the only person that I'm aware of who actually has used a lightweight for its intended purpose in the field. Really? Yes. I know people that own them. You're the only one that uh, that has actually used it for its intended purpose. So did you load them onto airplanes Did uh, and did they parachute out of airplanes? Um, these particular ones we loaded in Hercules and we were dropped to air, airport. So we didn't actually parachute these ones out. But having said that, I was uh, at the station I was at was uh, where they used to practice doing heavy drops. They'd have the Hercules coming down the runway and they would drop it from something like 100 feet without parachutes just to test the pallets and, and stuff like that. And I should say it was a good... 
sixty percent that didn't make it off the runway, but they they don't bounce very well. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. No, they don't bounce straight. You know, they sort of come down at an angle and bang and roll over and flatten them and. Yeah. So sixty percent needed replacement, and the other forty percent needed a lot of repairs. Correct. Yes. 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 Maybe ten percent made it off the off the. You know, they could drive them away, but uh, it wasn't a very successful test. Let's put it that way. So they didn't bounce very well. And the ones that didn't make it, did they just junk them, or were those? put back into for civilians to pick up no no they would put those to one side and use them for spares you know nothing going to work because a lot of these had a you know pretty expensive radio equipment in them so you know they they, they didn't certainly didn't strap them out to be really really twisted and bent and distorted and even then when they went for disposal all that stuff was taken out anyway parts is parts you know <laughs> mm, indeed were these all series threes correct yes was that the only ones you were that you used? Well, the first Land Rover I ever drove was a, about a 1965 2A, which we used to call the uh, the company hack, which most people learned to drive in, um, which is what I learned to drive in. And the thing had about 30 degrees of steering variability. <laughs> oh, right on. At least four pumps of the brake before you even felt that you were going to slow down. The gearbox, well, you know, if you found a gear, you were doing well. Uh, it, it was awful. It was the worst vehicle I've ever driven. But they said, you know, if you could drive this and maintain it on the road, you'll be doing all right when you come across a proper one. You know, so it, teaches you, it teaches you patience and advanced planning. <laughs> for sure you have to think a long way ahead of before you want to stop or turn the circle that's for sure and of course what are you you're all of what 18 19 years old about 19 at that point yeah so you really don't know any better no yeah no. <laughs> pretty sure that's what the military looks for people who don't know any better <laughs> <laughs> yeah people that can't argue back as well you know they, they tend to look for those with that 65 2a was was that a lightweight no no, okay. no, no, it was no. just a regular GS general service. The springs were shot and, you know, it was all baggy, baggy back end on it. And it was just dinted and, oh, it was in a terrible shape. It had been well loved. Yes. It had one careful owner. <laughs> <laughs> so was that when, is that when you got the bug then? Is that when uh, you started to bleed green, whatever, get the disease, whatever phrase we like to use? Well, all, all the vehicles that we had in that particular unit were all Land Rovers. So, um, you know, you, we got used to it and I was on, called into duty one, one weekend where it was, you know, obviously everybody has to do a, a bit of a duty, guard duty sort of thing. And I was sat in my little office there watching the TV quite happily. And then I got a call to say one of the REF guards had found one of our offices open so then I had to go and investigate. So I get in the little old Land Rover, which happened to be a 2A lightweight. Um, I remember that. And it was a soft top with the open back. I drove it, parked it up, and I had this funny feeling that something wasn't quite right. And uh, anyway, as I'm just about to get out of the car, the uh, REF police guy and his huge huge German shepherd jumped in the back of the truck and these do the dog was about four inches away from the back of my head, snarling his head off, <laughs> thinking I was attacking. And the, the dog handler was hanging on to him for dear life, trying to keep him away from me. And that is, that is one of the most scary moments of my life, I think. Totally unexpected. This thing was solid black. I didn't see it at all. And it just... <laughs> He was, oh, wow. I suspect that the, the only part on him that wasn't black was his teeth. Well, that's right. That's right. And his, his glowing eye. This poor old uh, REF corporal apologizing profusely. And I said, well, that doesn't help me much. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, there was, it was a false alarm. There was no problem. Somebody had just forgotten to shut the door properly. So after a full survey, uh, you know, uh, walking around... 
with full, fully cocked SLR under my arm, just in case we had a, an intruder. Is this in Germany? No, this was in England. This was so, in England. So, so in the end, you have to shut the doors and then then yeah. cycle, cycle the locks four times to reset the alarm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't have things like alarms back then. We, we weren't that sophisticated, I suppose. But uh, anyway, so we just locked it up and put a note in my report that, that this is what had happened. Another time, uh, the same REF base, actually, this was quite funny. Uh, one of my buddies um, got a little bit worse worse for wear for drink and decided to go and hijack one of the Land Rovers and go for a tour around the, uh, the runways. There's, there's three runways and two what they call peri tracks, perimeter tracks. And he was he was decided just to go for a run, you know, a drive around. And it was foggy. And he's doing about 30 miles an hour down the runway. Somebody or, or ran around one of the peri tracks and they parked an Argosy aircraft in this peri track. And uh, anyway, he hit the front wheel at like 30 miles an hour. Oh my. Uh, and the, the front of the plane came down on the rover. And luckily, oh. it didn't hit him or anything, it didn't cause him any damage at all. But he, w- he was sober, immediately sober, I bet. Yes, he was. And his feet didn't touch the ground between there and the guard room, I don't think. Then, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. He was all off and we didn't see him again. Actually, he disappeared. <laughs> he was off to uh, Aldershot, I think, to uh, get get uh, reminded of what why, why he was in the military and what he's supposed to be doing. That was quite an incident. What uh, RAF base was that? Uh, that was RAF Benson, which is just outside Oxford. I think it's closed down now, actually. But that's where the uh, Queen's flight was, where Royal Helicopters and the Royal Planes used to be for flying, because it was close to London, it was close to Windsor and all those sort of places. But So their, their version of our Andrews... Yes, yeah. It was very, it was, in its day, it was, uh, you know, quite a place. And uh, that's where they put, when the Duke of Windsor died over in Paris, when he died, they, they brought his coffin over there overnight. And I was one of the guards there to guard his um, coffin before they took it off to Windsor. And so you're in the, you were in the military for, what, five or six years, it sounds like? And then you were completely exposed to Land Rovers the whole time? Seven years, I would say, yeah, yeah. Did you become a mechanic or work on them, or were you just a driver? Um, I, I was odd job, really. I did all sorts of stuff. You know, they, they, they didn't really know what to do with me. I, I My skills weren't apparent. You know, I, I used them when we were a, a, an air portable place, but when they sent me to Germany, they didn't really know what to do with me. So I, I ended up doing a bit of mechanicing and driving and all sorts of stuff. Oh, had you been a mechanic before you got into the military? No, I trained, I trained, believe it or not. This is a funny story, if you like. I went to college because I wanted to be a pinball machine repair person. I, I was fascinated with how pinball machines work. <laughs> that's, a all- trade, that's a trade you don't hear about. So I, I, I thought, you know, this would be quite a good thing to do because, you, you know, when you lift up a pinball machine and you see all the relays and switches and all this sort of stuff underneath, I thought, oh, that looks interesting. And my father was a, an electrical engineer into refrigeration as well. And uh, so I sort of took a bit from him. And so I went to college for a while. Then some idiot went and invented this stupid game called Ping. Um, or Pong, whatever it's called, where you have these two little things batting a little device across the screen. Yep, I had one of those. Yeah, well, pop, ping, pop, and go across. <laughs> anyway, so everybody was getting rid of their ping, I mean, their pinball machines and putting these in instead. So my degree in engineering was totally useless. Nobody wanted to employ a pinball machine mechanic. I thought, well, this is this is crazy. So that's when I decided to join the army. Those machines are collectible now. I know. There's, there's a lot of money in those old pinball machines. There is, and especially the double flipper ones and all that sort of stuff. It's crazy money. New version of them, the electronic version of that. Oh, they're nowhere near as they're not as. No, they're not the same thing. It's just like Land Rovers, right? You have the the originals, and you have the heritage version, and you have the more modern tradition, more modern ones. I, I, I like the way that people are saying, you know, the heritage defender. Now, I thought, what? 
what are you talking about? You know, it's a defender. I prefer the term legacy myself. Oh, legacy. There you go. Or classic. You know, that's the other one, isn't it? Yeah, Range Rover kind of took that one. I, I like Legacy better. See, I blame Land Rover for not calling the new Defender the Series Two like they sh- like they were supposed to, because then you need to make the distinction between the older one and the newer one. They should have done. They should have given it a new name. And why they call the Evoke a Range Rover? I don't know. Why don't they just call it the Land Rover Evoke and have to tag it with a Range Rover? I don't know. We could have had a good competition about a new name for the. New Defender. I don't know. I, I can't even think of a name that I'd like to give it. Well, I th- and I think that's one of the reasons why the Defender be- still is called the Defender, because what are you going to name it that's not already taken? Well, there's always Offender. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get out of the military, let, let, we should move on with your, your Land Rover history. You know, When do you encounter your Land Rover next? Um, after I left the military, I, I sort of jobbied about for a bit, doing odd things here and there. And then I, a um, buddy of mine was working for a Land Rover dealership, actually a Jaguar Land Rover dealership. <laughs> and uh, he said, why don't you come and join us? You know, you're not doing too much with your life right now. And I'm sure, let's have a go for that. I joined them. They also were Rolls-Royce and Daimler agents. So I started to get into that side of stuff, which I thought was very nice, a um, bit, bit different. And, you know, learning about Triumph. Did you own any Land Rovers at that time? I did not have any. I had an old Rover car, a Rover P4. It was a Rover 60, which is the same engine as a Series 1, two-liter side valve engine. So I had that for a couple of years. So you could walk faster, you're saying? <laughs> no, it was a great car, actually. It had some amazing features on it. But there's a nice little story that when I bought it, I bought it out. I was in a pub, and somebody was selling a car, and I said, oh, I'm in need of a car. And he said, well, i got one in the car park. You can have it for 50 pounds. And I went, oh, really? What's that then? He says, oh, I'll Rover over there. He says, we don't run at the moment, but, you know, um, you can have it, 50 pence. Hence, hence the price. Yes. <laughs> a couple of evenings, we got it running, uh, found out that, you know, simple thing. It got the plug wires around the wrong way, tuned it up a little bit, and we used it as a family car for about three years, I think, until it uh, unfortunately failed its MOT because of some corrosion on the inner sills. When when that got broken up, I was working for a Land Rover dealership then, and uh, we used that engine in a Series 1 because the Series 1 engine blew, so it continued. The next Land Rover we had, uh, I was uh, working at a Land Rover dealership in Market Raisin. It was a brand-new dealership, and I was the parts manager there. A customer that came in worked at uh, the local or a small airfield, a small private airfield. And uh, he kept coming in and ordering these parts. I said, what, what are these for then? He said, oh, it's for a, an old Land Rover, a fire engine. I said, oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? You know, for, of course, that piqued my interest. And uh, I said, well, what sort of thing is it then? So he said, I'll bring you some pictures next time. And it was a 54, 1954. Uh, so it's a later series one fire engine. He says, uh, actually, he says we may be replacing it soon. Uh, he says, if, when we get to sell it, I'll let you know. I went, okay, sounds like a deal. We were, uh, about six months goes past, and uh, he came in and he, he said, well, we're doing sealed bids. Uh, if you want to put your offer in, I'll put it in, and whoever gets the highest bids gets the deal. I said, okay. So I put a bid in of one hundred and fifty pounds. And uh, nobody else put a bid in. (laughs) (laughs) So I I was a lucky owner of a 1954 Series 1 fire engine. So you won by default. (laughs) Yes. The unfortunate thing is that it was painted stripy um, black and yellow because they had to have black and yellow on the airfield, apparently. So it would have been been awesome in Pittsburgh. Yes. (laughs) So I had that for a while, and uh, and somebody persuaded me to sell it to him because he, he offered me wads of cash. So uh, at the time, I, I, I just let it go. And at that time, actually, is when I started the Lincolnshire Land Rover Club back in 1983. And um, it, it was, it's a club that's still going very strong. You know, they've hosted the national rallies over in England a few times. Yeah, that was the start of the Lincolnshire Land Rover Club, if you like. 
So wait, 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 let's let's not just let that go. So you you founded the Lincolnshire Land Rover Club. Way, way to bury the headline. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Just you? Did you? Were there others that helped you? Um, well, I, it was my initial idea, and I went on actually another radio program to promote it. Uh, I called up the local Lincolnshire radio, which was uh, the BBC Radio, and got interviewed and 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 put my name over and said, I've, I've, "I'd like to get this club going. I think Lincolnshire needs one. There's, every other county's got one, but Lincolnshire doesn't have one." I think we should have one. Luckily enough, I don't know whether this guy's name means anything to you, but Ken Slavin, who used to run uh, expeditions across Africa, was also uh, um, a guy that lived in Lincolnshire and somebody I knew reasonably well. And uh, he he co-sponsored me and uh, pushed it through, you know, pushed us along a little bit more along with the dealership I worked for. And starting off, there was 19 of us met at a, like a social club to try and get the club going. And then um, by the end of the year, we'd been incorporated, registered with Land Rover down in UK, uh, you know, down at Load Lane. And uh, we were an official Land Rover club. Outstanding. And it still exists because I pulled up their website. It's llrc.co.uk, Lincoln Trail Land Rover it. Club. Still rocking and rolling. Yes, absolutely. With the Lincoln Imp as their, uh, as their main emblem, really. Outstanding. So that was in 1983. Uh, what, what Land Rover did you own at that time? At that time, I had that Series 1 uh, fire engine. And that was sort of got me over the hump of, of getting into it. And um, and then, you know, we had a couple of old, older classic Range Rovers and things like that at the time. Then I sort of backed off from it a little bit um, because my family didn't like off-roading. My wife certainly at that time certainly did not like off-roading. Um, so we, we backed off from that a little bit and, um, it was a while before I got back into Land Rovers. And, and when does that happen? Are you in the United States by this time? I am. Well, by this time, sort of 12 years later. Yes. Yes. By that time I was, I was heading this way. Um, and then as soon as I got here, obviously I had to have a Land Rover working for Rovers North. You got to. Is that how you got to the United States then? They, they, Rovers North hired you to be their inventory parts manager? Correct. Yes. Yeah. For, from a company that we used to deal with uh, over in UK. Mark saw my potential, I guess, and, and brought me over. He imported you. <laughs> Were you more than 25 years old? Because, you know, to I be. Was. In- <laughs> yes, I, was, I, was. <laughs> I had to have the, the, the VIN inspection and everything. Yes. <laughs> so, so you were exempt from any emissions that you might produce. <laughs> well, I, I can never admit to that. <laughs> <laughs> So then when you get to Vermont and uh, roking for Rovers North, any notable Land Rovers that you've owned over the years or ones that you uh, wish to tell us about? Notable ones. Maybe they're notable just to you and that's okay. Well, the the first half ton that I built, which was a a really nice one, actually. It was a Series 3, late Series 3. And I believe it's still running to this day. What year? That was uh, about 1981, I believe. It was uh, built that one and put an overdrive on it and, you know, all the normal stuff. That was when, way back when uh, East Coast Rovers used to run uh, off, off-road off courses and stuff like that. They used to have events, basically the same weekend as the birthday party, if I remember rightly. It was just before July 4th. Anyway, we drove over to Maine in this lovely little Sharabang, me and my friend. Brian Durrett, who, who also used to work at Rovers North, and he had a 109, uh, one of the ex-military 109s that Rovers North was bringing in. We drove there and back without a hitch. Uh, that was a test run, and then um, I drove that one uh, July 4 week. It, I set off on Monday afternoon and arrived in Prescott, Arizona, on July on the Friday afternoon, which uh, I think it was July the 3rd or something like that. So you drove a Series 3 lightweight across the United States. Correct. And lived to tell about it. Yes, I, I survived the tale. And the funny thing is, you know, I, I there's a few times where I'd stop and just watch the sunset or something like that. You know, I'd sit on the spare wheel on the bonnet, just chill out, leaning against the windscreen. It, it just have a quiet moment, and then somebody would come up and say, when I was in the military, we used to have one of these. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, they were in the Marines, and, you know, when the Royal Marines used to do manoeuvres with the Marines, you know, they'd use them. And uh, so it was, it was, you know, you're just having a quiet moment, and you don't expect somebody to come up and recognise, you know, call it a jeep or something, but, you know, we actually knew what it was and what they were used for, which was quite remarkable. But Yes, it is. Four, four separate occasions, people came up to me and knew exactly what it was, which was quite remarkable. That is and impressive. What year is this that you drove across country? That was in 96, that was. And I assume you drove it back. No, no. When I drove it there, I bumped into somebody, actually a place called Skull Valley, which is just outside Prescott, Arizona. And this guy offered to buy it there and then. How do I get home? He said, I'll buy your air ticket as well. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Same deal to me. All right. <laughs> so you you build up this half ton lightweight, drive it across country, sell it, sell it on the spot, and then fly home. Correct. And then what happens? What happened? Uh, I, I, I stayed in contact with the guy and he still got it to this day. A year ago, I spoke to him and he still had it. So that was quite remarkable. And what was your next Land Rover then? The one after that. Um, then I started to get into Range Rover. Range Rover Classics over here. You can, or, or at that time, you could buy them very, very cheap, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, and you could buy a, a pretty decent Range Rover. So I thought, if I'm using this as my daily driver, let's have a bit of comfort. Yes, yes, we all we understand. We all understand. Yeah. <laughs> Having driven a lightweight, anything is an upgrade for comfort. <laughs> Did you have a number of classics then? I had I, I, I had at one time five of them at one time and that, that slimmed right down and I've I've still got one up in our, our place up in Vermont. Um it's a ninety three long wheelbase that one. They've they've come and gone. But then we started, I've always been against Discovery Ones. I always thought they were horrible and noisy and not as comfortable as my Range Rover Classic, which, you know, you get used to a, a certain vehicle. It was handy for having the drop-down tailgate, lifting things on and all that sort of stuff on the Classics. And uh, it was very good. You know, we, we had one for the longest time going backwards and forwards from uh, where we lived in South Burlington, Vermont to Cabot, Vermont, which is about 50 miles, I suppose, 55 miles. And it was a very comfortable car to get backwards and forwards with all our paraphernalia that we needed for camp and towing. And, you know, it was exceptional for towing. So we had that one, a 90 Ranger that I had for the longest time, which was a, a very good car until somebody decided to drive out in front of me and, and not the front of it. Um, and that was basically the end of that one. So with the funds that I got from that, we went out and bought two more. <laughs> so we ended up with a, an 88 and a, an 89, which I think is the perfect year for a, a classic Range Rover because you've got all the, the goodness without some of the stuff that you still, you haven't got the ball worn a transfer box, but you've got all the, the stuff, the 3.9 and all that stuff going on without the ball worn a transfer box. Yeah, we had we had some good times with that one. In preparation for the podcast, I know you you asked what questions we were going to ask, and I think you made a list of all your your all your Land Rovers. How many have have you owned? Uh, let's see, we've had five Range Rovers Classic, three Discovery Ones, two One Tens. This is crazy. Fifteen series vehicles. Wow, <laughs> nice. nice. How many lightweights? Three. Three of the fifteen. Three were lightweights. Correct. Yes. And uh, another story is when I, I sold a 109, uh, ex-military 109, and uh, the condition was that I drove it to its, its, the person that bought it, and he lived in New Jersey. In 2003, I drove it from Vermont down to New Jersey, and we set off at, I don't know what time of day it was, about 8 o'clock in the morning, something like that, and we got there about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And that was that was a trip. That was that was quite the trip. And it, it, I mean, that was such a sweet mode to that one too. Did you drive through New York City? No, <laughs> no. I I, I I I can't imagine driving a series vehicle through New York City somehow. 
I know, it, yeah, I, I, I'm sure someone's done it, but you, know, you, you would think it would be a challenge. You, you get a merit badge for driving a series truck in, you know, one of the largest city in North America. Yes. I really don't enjoy driving anything in New York City. <laughs> yeah. What do you currently own that's in your fleet? What is in my fleet currently? We have a, a lightweight that I'm rebuilding, which has a bit of an interesting history. It's uh, an XREF one. It's uh, built in 1969, around about July, actually, 1969. That one's got a bit of a story to it. When, when I first came over here and I built my lightweight, I parked it up at a place and this other guy came in and he had a lightweight as well. And he parked next to me and uh, came to find me where I was and sort of introduced himself. Very nice guy. And I said, you know, if you ever want to sell that, let me know. He said, yeah, 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 of course I will. And every time I said it, you know, I, I saw him, you know, have you decided to sell it yet? You know, no, no, no. no. But anyway, unfortunately, um, three years ago, he, he passed away. Um, he had uh, cancer, unfortunately, and um, he passed away. And, and uh, his, his widow called me up and said, he wanted you to have this. So, you know, you, you've always asked after it and, I know it'll go to a good home if you take it on and, and that. And, and I thought, well, I don't really need one at the moment. You know, it's, uh, it's going to burgeon my garage, you know. And, and I really didn't want to take it on. I said, uh, I said I'll tell you what we'll do then. I said, you know, and it was a bit, it's, it's, he only used it to go to and from town, which was a, a distance of about five miles, but he never cleaned it. In the winter, he only used it in the winter, so it built up an awful lot of salt and stuff. So the bulkhead was starting to show its vulnerability to yeah. Vermont. The bulkhead was starting to not exist. Yeah, the metal rats were starting to eat it. Yes, I I took it on, and uh, anyway, we I, I said, you know, well, what I'll do is I'll I'll do it and I'll sell it. And the profit I make after, uh, you know, deducting what I've got into it, we'll, we'll uh, buy a chair in his memory and at the hospital, at the, uh, the rehab place where he was. She thought that was a nice idea. So that's what we're going to do. That is a nice idea. Yeah. It's going to be a nice little truck when it's done. And it was, I, I was going to, it was camo, a camo truck. Um, but when I started to clean it down a little bit, it's got this lovely REF blue underneath it. You know, I really don't want to restore this car. I just don't have the equipment or, the, you know, the, the stuff to do it with. Um, but you get to a point where I wouldn't be doing it justice if I didn't do it properly. So it's taking me a bit longer than I normally would do to rebuild a vehicle, but I'm taking me time and there's so much that's been cobbled on it because originally it was a right-hand drive. It's been made left-hand drive. Originally, it's 24 volt. It's been Some of it's been made 12 volt. Like uh, I was doing the fuel tanks on it because one of those started to leak. One of the fuel senders is 24 volt. The other one's 12 volt. Oh, so, nice. <laughs> and, and they were both locked up. You know, they were seized solid. So I thought, well, you know, you get to a point and you just, keep going and every every time you undo a nut or a bolt there's something else another bit of an adventure there and then oh the, the funny thing was when i got to do the head the cylinder head because i knew it was blown a head gasket the head off had it gone and checked and apparently it was cracked from one from the front to the back across all the cross plug i guess it had been stored outside with water in it no coolant and you know it split the head so that was a new head required for that which i didn't anticipate doing every every time i take something apart it's it's an adventure and what what else do you own currently I've got my little 90 my 8790 the former uh, 9t 9t yeah the retired 90 uh i'm building a one or a 109 resto mod it's a 109 it's going to have a 300 tdi automatic in it oh nice that's my thing now what's your daily driver my daily driver i'm sad to say it's a ram truck <laughs> no that's that's that actually that's about what every everyone has some non-land rovers they're daily come on <laughs> uh, well so most me. people sane people people that are smart uh, have a non-rover in the fleet somewhere. It's a V6 diesel, which is absolutely incredible. It gets 28 to the gallon, which is 
phenomenal. Yes. Um, For a full size truck. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's so comfortable. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, yes. I, I went out yesterday down to Sarasota, which is a distance of about 45 miles, I suppose, in my little 90. <laughs> and I was crippled by the time I got back, you know, <laughs> right, right. driving the truck for so long, you know, and driving that and having a manual shift and my left leg was all blah, locking up so many clutch changes. But anyway, yeah, I still enjoy driving my 90. Um, back in 2020, I had the, well, before that, actually, um, about a year before that, I had this marvelous idea of calling, uh, Lincoln Lincolns, uh, which would be a, a program of uh, joining all the Lincolns, starting in Lincoln, because that's where I come from in Lincolnshire in UK. Uh, and every state has got a Lincoln or a Lincolnville in each state. So my fine idea was to drive between all these and link them all up and raise funds for initially, which is, is the reason why I retired, for multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. This is, uh, I started that off back in 2020, and I was actually in UK uh, in February 2020 before all the COVID started. And we, we did start with the Lincoln Chiland Rover Club at the Bomber Command, which is uh, Bomber Command Centre, which is in Lincoln. We met one Saturday morning, actually, February the 8th, and uh, there was about seven or eight of us in series vehicles, various series vehicles, and for a, a drive around the, the highlights of Lincoln. And so we made a little convoy when we started at the um, top of the hill, and we drove round to the cathedral, the castle, and we joined. Uh, we went to see Bar St Barnabas Hospice, which is a, um, a hospice pay, a place for cancer patients and, and the like. Uh, we dropped there. We had raised at that point two hundred and fifty pounds, um, which we donated to St Barnabas Hospice Fund, and when they were very grateful for that. They provided us with tea and coffee, and some cake, which was nice to meet the nurses there. They're very friendly people, very nice, and some of the staff there. From there, we went to the Lincolnshire Life Museum which if anybody's in the Lincolnshire area, you know, it's well worth a visit. And it shows you going back to sort of the 1600s and the development of all the different uh, agricultural equipment. And uh, Lincoln used to be quite a manufacturer of um, like Rust and Bucyrus cranes, a lot of steam engines, there's threshing machines there and all anything to do with farming or industrial work. The, the Rustons have, have done that. And also Ruston Gas Turbines, which is owned by Napier Turbines now, uh, they're still there that provide um, turbines for pushing the gas through the pipes and that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's quite a – it used to be an industrial place at one time. But uh, anyway, so we went from there and then we went round to the football club, Lincoln City Football Club, parked up there. We've got some good photographs of all the club members there. And then we drove there from there and then back up to the Bomber Command Centre and had lunch up there, which was, it was great to see some people who I haven't seen for a long time in the Lincolnshire Land Rover Club. And I, I think we did some good. We're raising awareness about the myeloma, which was my goal. And now we've, we've sort of morphed on from the multiple myeloma is, is, is going for kidney donation, which is my next goal, is to try and make awareness of, of people to uh, become donors for kidneys and how important it is for folks out there to, to sign those donor cards. You know, we don't realize while we're all healthy and well how many other people out there are, are not quite so fortunate. If we can make use of our organs, you know, when we don't have any use for them anymore, all the well and good, in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've devoted my life to keeping Land Rovers going by using parts from ones that aren't capable of going anymore. So in my opinion, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say the same thing about my body. I mean, I've tell people when I go, if I've got parts that are still usable and somebody needs them, that's where they go. 
here in Pennsylvania, you can, I think actually maybe, I think in every state in the union, I believe you can be, you know, indicate that you're an organ donor. Right, right on your driver's license. It says organ yeah. donor. Exactly. Yeah, mo- most driving licenses, certainly in Florida and Vermont, you can write on there, you are a donor. Um, and that's a good thing. And have it written into your advanced directive as well, which I think it's important that folks do fill out that advanced directive. A very crucial time, the life of a, an organ is very short when somebody's no longer with us but uh, you know they, they've got to get in there and get that harvested as quickly as they can and you yourself are are in need of a kidney correct 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 i am um i'm currently on dialysis um which is a managed care but uh, you know the sooner we get into getting a a, a transplant the better the will be for the outcome and how can folks help you out directly in that need? Well, what they'd have to do is approach the a transplant center. I'm in contact with both uh, Mass General, um, their transplant center, and also Tampa General down here in Florida. If they go onto their websites uh, or if anybody wants any further information, I can certainly get that to them. I mean, if you want to provide a link, I can certainly send that on to you. I will do that. Yep. We'll have a link in the, sh- in the show notes. I can do that. I'll, I'll send that on to you afterwards. And, you know, the, the if anybody can help out, I'd be very, very grateful. And, and a lot of, you know, is obviously a lot of folks I've, I've, I've spoken to as I've been trying to sort of broadcast this is a lot of folks don't know their blood type or the blood group. And I think that's pretty important to know that. And I, I found that people don't know what their blood groups are. I'm actually surprised it's not on your license. It seems like that's something that should indicate on your license. If you're a race car driver, it's it's painted on the side of your car. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. I mean, well, I mean, it used to be, but now, I mean, quite often it's it's embroidered on your, your fire suit. Is there a, a, bl- a blood type that, uh, I guess, for, for kidney transplant also, that's, uh, is there a general blood type you're looking for or some other general indicators? This is another thing that I've been trying to push as a, as a sort of side thing. My, my personal blood group is B positive and my whole I don't know whether the, the, what the right word is my whole sort of life has been about being positive I was going to say know? that's a great outlook be positive and that's what I'd like to lead on to is be positive you know and and you could say I've been dealt a funny hand at the moment I'm, I'm maintaining positivity trying to stay positive well I am staying positive and I think you know, if I can push that to people in the similar circumstances, is you know, be positive. Are you aware there's a sitcom on Thursday nights called Be Positive? Yes, and that that sort of confused me. So my thought was, you know, the letter B, and I, I don't know whether you know, you know, when you're doing circuit diagrams and things like that, uh, you know, you get the positive negative thing. Oh yeah. So you could do something like that, you know, B pos in that symbolism, you know, like the B plus and then pos after that. You know, that would make it slightly different to how they're broadcasting that that, that show. Does someone have to be B positive to provide a, a transplant to you or can they be at any blood group? O would work as well. Okay, so B positive or O. Correct. So that's what I've been told I, I can accept is, I'd be either B positive or O. Okay. So if you're a B positive or O in the blood group and you're interested, we'll have a link in the show notes or you can uh, you know, contact Les through the podcast or if he provides us with it, you know, once his email or some other contact, we'll have that information on the, on the, on the website. Yeah. What I'd think it'd be a good thing to do is that that link will show you what you're letting yourself in for before they even ask the question. <laughs> that Absolutely. will let you- exactly what what the process is and you know what to expect if you are a donor if you're a live donor what to expect uh, yeah because that, that live donor thing is a whole different ball game than, than the harvesting once i don't need it anymore situation correct yes right. indeed. i mean that's the ideal thing if i could find somebody that's a really 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 nice person would donate a, a live kidney it is very, very handy that we have our own spares. Those. Yeah. Yes. You, every human has two kidneys. Yes, and you only need one, really. So, if you lose one, doesn't the other one get slightly bigger to help compensate? Am I or am I uh, 
misunderstanding. Maybe that's the liver. Maybe the liver, I think if you lose a bit of the liver, it grows back. I think you're correct. Whereas, you know, you lose a bit of your liver, that will regenerate. So, yes, it's the same with the kidney. It will enlarge and, and, and work harder. Not, not that that's a bad thing because, you know, I'm not trying to oversell it or undersell it, but uh, it's, it's, you wouldn't notice the difference. Well, Les, thanks very much for coming on the program. If anyone is interested in uh, what kidney donation is about, we'll have a link in the show notes. And if you're uh, B positive or O, I encourage you to uh, go check that out on the website and uh, get, you know, Look, look, look into it and, and help out a, a, you know, a member in need here in the, in the Land Rover community. So Les, what, what, uh, what's the future hold for you? Well, well, currently, I'm currently we, the Royal, we, I suppose I am working <laughs> on a, uh, a, an article for Rovers North, uh, um, on about the diesel engines, the evolution of the diesel engines. That's going to be, uh, up on the website and then on to distant future of the full article, um, a somewhat slim down version is going to appear in three or four different editions of the rovers news showing the evolution of the f- the four cylinder which is what i based on the four cylinder diesel engine um and then that will go from the two liter diesel right the way through through to the 300 tdi and the uh, 2.8 tdi um, and then the final installment for that, which is something I'm currently working on, is going to be the TD5, which is a whole basket full of interesting stuff. The uh, last Land Rover diesel? The last Land Rover developed diesel. Yes, indeed. That's the, 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 the last installment, and it's quite interesting. Probably the most tunable diesel engine of all the Land Rover engines, actually. So it's it's been quite interesting. But the thing I find, and I'm sure other people do this when they're researching anything, is the amount of rabbit holes that you end up going down. Oh, yeah. Uh, the information that I found was, I should say, when it comes to press, you'll only see about a quarter of the information that I actually found. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if people are interested in two, uh, sorry, uh, two stroke diesels and stuff like that. But, um, that was quite interesting learning about two. <laughs> Those are so cool. I love the sound of a two stroker. <laughs> it's, 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 that was interesting that, and especially a giant Detroit two stroker. Those things sound so mean. And the, the, the Cummings diesels as well, you know, of the uh, early 30s and that, you know, they, they were phenomenal engines. And uh, I think some of those are still going to today. Cummins had the first d- diesel engine in the Indianapolis 500. That's right. Yeah. It competed the 500 mile race without refueling. It's the That's only incredible. car to have really? ever done that. Yeah. Wow. And I found a picture of Mr. Cummings putting uh, um, one of the bus engines into a car. And I can't remember which car it was off the top of my head. But he drove from one coast to the other, and it cost him $7.67 in diesel. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, won't, you won't drive across town for that money anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's just phenomenal. The information that I found was that, And I thought, well, nobody's really interested in that. So we won't put that in there. Well. Some of us nerds are, but, but yeah, it's, it's hard to devote magazine space. So even though you're retired from Rovers North, you're still involved, associated with Rovers North. Yes, I still take um, tech calls and, and that uh, for folks that track me down. So I'm, I'm still out there. <laughs> so we're still helping people keep their vehicles on the road, which is the end goal anyway. So, you know keeping customers happy. Les, I want to thank you for coming on the program, talking with us and giving us your, your background, where you came from. It's, I don't know, I found it fascinating and good luck with myeloma. Uh, good health to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. It's great meeting both of you and uh, having a good chat. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed show number 112. Thanks to Les Parker for coming on the program and talking to us about his uh, Land Rover history and experience. If you are interested in helping out Les, please, we'll have a link in the show notes uh, to that and uh, or get in contact with Les. You know, if you're certainly, if you're the right blood type and want to consider it, please reach out to Les and good luck to Les in the future with his health. 
And also thanks to the One Tree Pax for his continued production support. We need to encourage uh, Pax to get back into Land Roverness. You probably don't know he he doesn't own a Land Rover at the moment. Oh no. I know we need to uh, encourage that. <laughs> well, I, I bear own Land Rover as well. So, <laughs> well, we need, uh, that's why do you think we've been uh, saying get your Rover ready? We that's also directed at you, Morgan. I am very well aware that you look directly at at my face on the screen. I when do. You say that. <laughs> I do every time when I say that. You have eleven months to get your Rover ready. Visit our website, centersteer dot com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's podcast. We post a new podcast at the end of every month. You can connect with us on YouTube. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, voicemail, and you can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer spelled in the British way. At least center is, and I guess also steer in the British way. Uh, you can buy a t-shirt, a sticker, or you can buy us a tea slash brown water. Click on store on the menu of our website for more details. If you have an idea for a guest, send us the details and contact information if you have it. In honor of Land Rover's 75th anniversary, you are invited to bring your Land Rovers, especially Series and Defenders, to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in 2023, July 2023. I am very looking forward to being there, and you now have 11 months to prepare, just like I do. Speaking of the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, when we're recording the news here, that was yesterday, which was uh, July 23rd, my review of the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix International Car Day, British Car Show, the races that take place at Shenley Park. And this is where the next year's event I'm hoping to have uh, and inviting everyone to will, would take place. We had a great Rover, Land Rover turnout. There were new Defenders, old Defenders. There was a Range Rover Classic. There was a Freelander. <clears throat> it was functional, driven under its own power. It's the one we saw last year, uh, the G4 that was there. And then uh, someone on uh, one of the posts I put out about the pictures uh, reminded us uh, that uh, the G4 Freelander is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Oh, nice. I hope to see a full page article in the OVLR News. Is that uh, G4 Freelander, the one from the, the Barris collection, Underpowered Hour, that has a, that's, I understand, has a, a series running gear underneath it, running a probably a two liter diesel? So it's reliable, more reliable than a no, a sir. Real this, one? <laughs> this is a fresh from the factory Land Rover Freelander G4 edition. They took it out of the Gaden Mount Museum. Excellent. <laughs> And, and also, <laughs> that was good. That was good. And also, Scott Wickham, known as a scooter, I think, in the Land Rover community, well known in generally as scooter, he helped to found the Fort Pitt Land Rover Group. So you probably know Scooter. He f- got back into Roverdom, uh, thanks to the podcast, he told me. He has a, a 1986 90, Defender 90, that is XMOD, uh, served in uh, Scotland, and I forget what country he told me. It was another country, uh, but it was an, it's a, an RAF vehicle. Uh, I think it seems to be a general service RAF vehicle. He's uh, the former owner, had all the documents on it, and Scooter said it's he has like two inches stacked of documentation on you know its history, where it came from, and what it did, and all that stuff. So nice looking vehicle, in good shape, canvas top. The most interesting was the Series 2A owned by Bob Raffensperger, and I've certainly invited him to come on the show. I hope he will. So Bob, if you're listening, you know, you're, you're at open invitation. I'll be reaching out to you soon to set that up. He has a Series 2A left-hand drive. It's a doormobile, and it's a doormobile special, which is even more rare and unique. It does not have the pop-up top, and that's what makes it a special. And apparently, he, uh, Terry Ann has seen it, and she she was uh, most impressed uh, by the fact of how unique and interesting it was, and is in good shape. The really cool thing, it's a, because it's special and the top doesn't pop up, they have it designed that all the seats lie flat, including the front seats. So the front seats, the center seats, they all lie flat and they can also contort to different combinations. You could have the seats go up on the side, like if you wanted to sit on the side, like say, and put a table in the middle, or you can have them lined up like you normally would in a traditional seating position. And you probably saw the pictures online. I, I posted those, at least, certainly on the outside, a roof rack on top. And Bob did some uh, two interesting things with it uh, of note. One is uh, because he had the jerry cans on the front wings and in, in front of the he- uh, marker lights, the indicator lights, 
he put blanks in those and then moved up on top of the wing. I think he created them from what I understand. And this will hopefully get him on the program and talk about that. Uh, he created these covers for the lights that have been moved up into the top of the wing. So you probably saw that one picture. It was all wet. Bob did that. And I guess he said he sold those for a number of years through Rovers North for those who uh, were interested in that upgrade. And also he has land blender. Yes. He created and has a, has a great box there's a blender in it and it plugs right into the PTO of the front of the vehicle and he fired it up and, and you smash the yellow knob like you would inside, but you smash the yellow knob and the blender whizzes away. It's fantastic. I've seen it. <laughs> it's it's really it's good. In, in British speak, that's its party piece. I mean, it's a great vehicle, uh, independent of all that, but that is, you know, that's the thing that drives everyone just comes up and wants to see that and they hear it rolling, you know, hear it going and they want to, you know, hey, you had some ice. Where's the ice? You know, all, all the... All the things come up. Yeah, what do you put in that? Gin and tonic, of course. So that was the uh, Grand Prix. We had a great time. It was stinking hot like it always is until about 2.30 when you get noticed that there's a severe thunderstorm warning. And not a watch. Warning. I pull up radar all the way from Erie down to south of Pittsburgh in, in Ohio, uh, over in Ohio. You can just see this line coming. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we got about <laughs> half an hour. We got 20 minutes. We got 10 minutes. Rover people. We'll, we'll, we'll just sit underneath the pop-ups. And then the wind picked up. And the wind picked up, which I have not seen wind like that before uh, at the Vintage Grand Prix. I've certainly seen wind before. But uh, blowing everything around. And then people scrambled. A couple cars that were open top convertibles and such. They were moving about half hour before the storm arrived, but then like 10 minutes before it arrived and the, and the, uh, the wind picked up is when everybody started moving <laughs> and they were scrambling for the exits, Jaguars, Bentleys. You looked over into the field and I, I think I, I did post a picture of this. You look into the field and there's like five cars left quickly got out of there. <laughs> I was staying because I, I live east of the of Pittsburgh and I would have just been in the storm on the way. So I just hung out. It lasted about 20 minutes. It, uh, where we were, thankfully, was not heavy rain, but there were other, there was uh, some strong winds and, and heavy rains in other parts of Pittsburgh. And there's some still people without power a day later. Uh, they're dealing with that. And I believe a tree I, I heard came down on the race course there in Shenley Park and they, they stopped racing for the day and they were resuming racing today when we're recording this on Sunday, July 24th, but I had a great time. It was really nice to cool down right after that. <laughs> it was really, it was nice. It got rid of the humidity, dropped the temperature about 20 degrees. You recall this, uh, Morgan, when you came the, you, you came the last time, you know how you bake in the sun and then you're like done for the day. Nope. Oh yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah. That would, that would be very refreshing. It was at the right time. I mean, they didn't do the, the, the British car area has the awards, uh, they didn't do the awards, uh, announce them, and uh, you missed part of the racing, the trials that go on that day. But I did get to talk to a lot of people, which was great. Uh, got some ideas for people to come on the podcast to talk to them. And we're well, trying to get the Fort Pitt Land Rover group kind of restarted. We're going to have a social gathering in August. First time in a long time. I was talking to Jay Green. He lives here in the Pittsburgh area. And I, he sa I said, uh, Fort Pitt, uh, F Plurks, trying to get back together again. And he goes, what does that stand for? The Frontiers of Pennsylvania Land Rover Gang? Okay, maybe it's just funny to me. It actually stands for the Fort Pitt Land Rover Group, but I liked his Frontiers of Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, that's the nice thing about about acronyms is they can stand for almost anything. That, that could be an anarch fun thing. How about that, Dixon? Uh, alternate names for club acronyms. It'd be interesting. You, you uh, there's a there's a whole page, <laughs> uh, a whole issue of OVLR. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> So that was this year's Grand Prix for next year's. And they give a little advanced preview. Nothing's official yet, but this is the the hope and have talked to Vintage Grand Prix organizers. Maybe we will have our own Land Rover area, maybe like a display area. We're normally, in, you know, we're with the other British cars because the Triumph Club of Western Pennsylvania, they're the ones that actually run the British Car Day as part of the Vintage Grand Prix because they were around before the Vintage Grand Prix. And a Vintage Grand Prix this year celebrated its 40th year, 40th race, not year, 40th ra racing year. Then also, I think we might be able to get a lap on the race course, which would be really cool uh, to do, to take a lap. They will, they do allow that for other, uh, in past years, they've done that, especially on Saturday, which is trials day. So that'll probably mean that for those that are going to come, we'll need to have some sort of registration. Uh, this is all in the early planning stages. That would be cool though. 
I think it would just be cool. Uh, yeah, just something interesting. Have a to have a parade lap of the race course would be interesting, which is part of that. Oxford did. You may recall some photos that we had when Oxford was here in Pittsburgh. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. You may now resume your more important things. My mother-in-law thought I was a, a lunatic for messing about with Land Rovers.